So, what is free software? This is going to start by talking about free software, which is the basis of this issue, but not all of the issue. So what is free software? It's free in the sense of freedom. Free software is software that respects your freedom and your community. So we mean free in the sense of freedom, not in the sense of price. Whether you pay to get a copy of the program or not is a side issue. We're not really concerned with that because it doesn't affect the right and wrong of the situation. We're concerned with how the program treats you once you have a copy, regardless of how you got the copy. Does it respect your freedom or does it crush your freedom? Does it respect your community or does it divide the people in your community? Those are important moral issues about software. So that's how we judge what's right and wrong. Okay. So in English, the word free is ambiguous. I have to clear up what it means by explaining with the French word libre or the Spanish word libre or you know, I'm not sure whether in Danish the word free only refers to freedom. I'm sad to say I saw the word in use meaning gratis. And that's creating a confusion I hope you'll fight against. I make a point when, I, when speaking English never to use the word free to refer to price. When I want to say that the price of something is zero, I call it gratis or I call it zero price. So when I say free, you know I'm talking about freedom. But what is a program? What is a computer? A computer is a universal computing engine. But conceptually, it's very simple. It can only do one thing get the next instruction and do what that says. Then get another instruction and do what that says. And the next and the next, millions of times per second, it will get the next instruction and do what that instruction says. The instructions come from a program which is a bunch of instructions. And depending on what instructions that program contains, it will direct your computer to do this or that or that or that or that or that or that or almost in, an infinity of other things. In fact, the right program could direct your computer, the same computer, to do anything whatsoever except for the things that are impossible. So this raises the moral question of who gives the instructions to your computer. You might think it's you when really it's someone else. You might think that your computer is obeying you when really it's always obeying its true master. And it does what you want, what you ask for, if the true master gives permission. And otherwise it doesn't. With any program there are two possibilities. Either the users control the program or the program controls the users. It's always one or the other because there's no other possibility. When the users control the program, that's free software. <clears throat> Why so? Well, what is freedom? Freedom is having control of your own life, having control of the activities you do in your life. But if you use programs to do the activities, control of the activity requires control of the programs, control of what they do. So, when the users have control of the program, that program respects users' freedom and community, so it's free software. Practically speaking, in order for users to have this control, they need the four essential freedoms, which make the practical criterion for free software. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish for any purpose. Freedom one is the freedom to study the program source code and change it so it does your computing activities the way you wish. 
Why do we make a point of mentioning source code? Well, on the left is some source code. It is, source code is a mixture of English and math. And if you've learned that programming language, you can read it, understand it, and then change it to do something different. But in order to run it, we typically convert it into executable software, which is an enigmatic series of ones and zeros, <coughs> which stand for instructions. But it's not easy to figure out what the instructions mean if a program is this tiny, it wouldn't be a big job. A programmer could look up in the description of the instructions what instructions those ones and zeros mean and figure out what they would do. But for a bigger program, it starts to get hard. And for a, real, a realistic program uh, with maybe 50 or 100 million ones and zeros, it gets to be really hard to figure out what those instructions will do. It's so hard people don't even consider trying except as a last resort in a situation of desperation. So if the users get only the executable telling them, you're free to change this executable if you could figure out what it does, that's not respecting their freedom, that's mockery of freedom. This is why in stating freedom one, we insist that the users get the source code. These two essential freedoms together give us separate control over the program. That means I'm free to change my copies and you're free to change your copies. Here's an example of separate control. Four users using the same program, each one is free to change per copies and one of them is doing so, the other three are not. Well, this separate control is absolutely vital, but it's not enough to give all users control over their computing because most users are not programmers. They don't know how to study and change source code because they have other talents, other skills, they do other things. I don't agree with the people who say that everybody's supposed to learn how to program because I know that only some people are good enough at it to be able to take advantage of that for practical needs. But even though these people's fields are not programming, they deserve control over their computing. They deserve freedom in what they do. How can they have it? We have to go beyond separate control to collective control, which is the freedom to work together with other users to exercise control over what the program does. At the top, we see a group of three users who are collaborating in this way. The two on the right are touching the code. They must be programmers. The one on the left is not. Maybe that user doesn't know how to program but is participating in the control over what that program does because the users that are working together discuss together what changes to make. And that's where the non-programmers can have an influence. Those who collaborate in this way are those who choose to. At the bottom, we see two more users of the same program who are not working with that group and they're using the original version. Why are they not working together? Well, it could be any reason. Uh, maybe they dislike each other and one doesn't trust the others, or some, maybe they just, maybe they get along just fine, but they have different ideas of what they want this program to do. Maybe they don't know each other. Maybe tomorrow they'll get in touch and decide to work together, or not. The point is they're all free to work together with others when they wish. This collective control requires two more essential freedoms. Freedom two is the freedom to make exact copies and give or sell them to others when you wish. And freedom three is to make copies of your modified versions and give or sell them to others when you wish. This permits the group to, to cooperate 
because if one member of the group makes a modified version with Freedom 3, person can make copies of that and distribute them to others in the group. Then those users, through Freedom 2, can make more copies and distribute them to others in the group. However, the group is not required to have a legal structure or a name or a list of members. Whichever users are working together today, they're a group and the, these freedoms apply to them. So freedoms two and three are not limited in regard to who you can redistribute to. You can redistribute to whoever wants a copy if you wish. You can even offer copies to the general public if you wish, which means publishing that version. You're free to do that under Freedom 2. So if the program carries these four essential freedoms, then it is free software, 